Is it ladies first? Ladies first. Okay, I'm Lisa Allsop and uh, I run the gardening side of Camelan Garden Centre and Farm Shop. I'm Ian Allsop, I'm her husband <laughs> and I run the farm shop side of things here at Camelan. Camelan is a location here just up the road um, and it was a name that we liked because it's Welsh but it's easy for English people to say which we felt was important but also there is a thought that it translates to Camelot and there is a strong sense of the Arthurian legend in this area. The garden centre opened in 2016 and it came out of idle chats in a pub on a winter's night moaning about the lack of garden centres. Oh there's a bit of land up in the village that's not doing anything why don't you see if you can rent it. Um, a year and a half after that conversation we opened and that was four years ago. But looking back at photographs there are very few plant displays, a few pallets of compost and a lot of goodwill from people who came to our garden centre which was very very much in its infancy. Um, two years of developing that we felt that we needed to add a farm shop into the mix and also give him the opportunity to give up his day job of being a gardener and indulge in his love of cheese. Cheese yes I mean I've been a, a lover of cheese since since I was a, a wee boy. I, um, I've been a gardener all my life and recently you know, after 35 years it started to take its toll on my body especially living here and so I decided to uh, semi-retire and follow that passion of um, cheeses by selling it to the local population and beyond. I think that we are really passionate about plants grown in Britain and Welsh produce as well and it felt really important to us not to have things that had lots of air miles attached to them or that were grown abroad in polytunnels. We wanted plants that were hardy, that would cope with the Welsh weather um, and then we were really passionate about Welsh produce as a, as a whole. One thing that I'm, I have really developed a, a love for, a passion for, are alpine plants and we sell a lot of alpine plants because they cope with poor soil, uh, rubbish weather and you know being up at high altitudes. But also the shrubs that we sell from a, we buy from a nursery up in North Wales, they're really really hardy stock. Um, they're good quality, they're really good prices. I, th I think the starting point for me is not to sell plants that are poor quality and I just think that we've, we've fine-tuned it and, and found really good growers that, that sell their plants at good prices which means that they're affordable to most people. I specialise in good Welsh produce. It doesn't have to be local Welsh produce, as long as it's good it can come from the north, uh, <laughs> from the south, from the east. Um, there are criteria that have to be filled. I won't have palm oil for sale. Um, and it has to be decent. It has to be decent. I'm not getting any altar in, in that farm <laughs> shop. It, you know, it's too small. If it's got, you know, a present from Wales and then on the back made in Cornwall, it doesn't get in. And over the last two years I've been very surprised at the amount of produce that I've been able to find and we have had people come to us saying I do this I make a product I see it's not on your shelves would you like to sell it for me mm. and uh, for some products I'm the only outlet and they won't go anywhere else because we we sell it for them. So we had an unscheduled visit from um, Horticulture Wales there was a meeting cancelled nearby and they stopped on the off chance a very cold February day and we ended up standing and chatting for probably two hours out in the really cold and it's very open and exposed here um, and I, I did know about them I followed them on Instagram at that point but hadn't really used them as a resource using their Instagram account and it has been really interesting in seeing what other growers and nurseries there are and garden centres there are in Wales and kind of seeing that the challenges that they face um, and sort of I suppose in a distanced kind of way giving ourselves all a bit of support and supporting each other with our with our endeavours and it just gives me an idea of what what's going on around us and uh, just an opportunity to to kind of connect with other growers really another horticulture project the local honey flies off the shelf so i can't get enough of it as soon as it's there pretty much within a couple of days it's all gone and on the phone again um we've got some cracking pudge that we've just started uh, selling mm. that that's a, a a right winner with tourists and local meat for the mm. first year, I wasn't able to get any lamb, proper Welsh lamb. It was all roaming around on the fields over there. <laughs> I couldn't get any uh, any of it whatsoever. Um, a local farmer approached me last winter and said, we're, we're diversifying into selling from our farms. And so now we're, we're uh, regularly supplied with his lamb and it is gorgeous, mm. absolutely melt in the mouth stuff. We are very dependent on tourist trade, very yeah. dependent on it. We get local support, but the bulk of it is from, from tourism. And I think that's, if it's right to go on to that, is where it leads into the COVID lockdown. 
is that we had all sorts of big plans. We've got a little cafe, which is just behind us, that we opened for two days and then lockdown was announced, which we knew was going to happen. We wanted to have a couple of days of running the cafe to see, see whether it would work or not. Um, so we had all these ideas about what we would be doing to bring in extra customers, um, attract new people to the site, and then lockdown happened. And Ian suggested that we did food deliveries um, and offer it free local food deliveries. Uh, we didn't have a system set up, that was a mistake. We launched ourselves into it and we hit the ground running with that and within the third week we were delivering to 60 people. Um, so while it is, hasn't been the year that we expected it to be, there's been a lot of new challenges, but also we've, I think we've risen to the challenges that were, were presented to us and we've won ourselves new customers. But also through that, what we've realised is actually a lot of our customers are local. We're not dependent on the holiday trade for a big part of the growing year. They are local customers. They're people who have uh, been coming to the garden centre regularly and have supported us. Um, and that was a surprise. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people were scared to go to the supermarkets. We had an awful lot of isolating people. We mm. didn't realise actually how many people had to go into isolation for various reasons. Yeah. And um, it was obvious that the supermarkets early on weren't coping. Uh, with mm. deliveries, suddenly everybody wanted them to turn up on the doorstep with, with, with uh, food and, and what have you, and that just wasn't happening. So in a way, we filled a gap for, for quite a while while yeah. the supermarkets sort of got their heads around it. Mm. So yeah, we, we kind of got ourselves, our cog was put into place and you know, it was part of a bigger picture yeah. really, yeah. what we did, I think. I'm dreading the next accounts that I've got to go in. When I work out, because the profit margins on fruit and veg are very minimal, we were delivering, we didn't always know where people were, Ian would be driving around trying to find somewhere, towing a trailer full of compost, guzzling fuel. We just, you know, we, there's no, there was no profit in, in that element of what we were doing. Our turnover was okay. It, the profit margins were very, very low. When we were speaking to the environmental health officer that we deal with for here, um, we talked about the importance of gardening for people. And she said that her own father was desperate to garden and she was going to drop him off some plants. And she agreed that we could deliver plants and compost as long as we were out delivering food. So it was, wasn't an unnecessary journey. And that she also agreed that people could come and collect plants and compost if they were collecting food. Um, and that to us, that was a bit of a lifeline because it meant we could would sell the produce that we've got. We had to uh, invest in new equipment. We've had to pay for signage. We've had to pay for um, uh, hand sanitizer, masks, gloves which we bought in bulk because we have no idea how long this is going to last. The signage was changing frequently so that had to be uh, always co constantly changing the signage on the gate and around the shop um, but we also needed to pay people to come and help us because we couldn't manage the workload and the logistics of man managing deliveries. So we adapted, we reviewed it almost on a daily basis um, and then we made changes as we needed to just to try and manage the demand with the deliveries but also to make sure that we we met people's needs you know our board meeting was you know <laughs> in bed one one night just before lockdown occurred what do we do do we stay open and and do our best or do we just shut and you know hide and and, and, and accept and, yeah. and accept the consequences <laughs> yeah and uh, we we thought now we will stay open for as long as we for as long as is possible to stay open and, and i think the law and i think that that's partly because that's who we are we felt we wanted to offer our customers who have supported us a service while things were difficult for them and right up until last week we were still delivering to someone who was shielding and that was our last delivery to her last week um, and you know it felt important to be able to do that even if it was one customer only that we were delivering to we needed to do that while she needed us to supply her with the food I was also very conscious that a lot of my suppliers are family businesses mm. They don't have uh, too big profit margins and they, a lot of them would have just shut down and, and we would never have seen them again. So from my point of view, trying to keep them afloat yeah. by selling as much of their stuff as possible was important. I'm hoping that all of them have come out of this. We might have lost a couple, I don't mm. know, I haven't done the, the, the groundwork on that yet. But yeah, it was very important for me to keep as many people as possible afloat. One of the things I think that's been really affirming out of this whole experience with, with COVID and lockdown is the generosity of people who we, we know um, as friends, but who have stepped up to help us. And we've had volunteer 
volunteer helpers with the garden center who's basically rearranged the whole layout has been responsible for ordering plants managing deliveries another neighbor that helps us with the food deliveries and then a fantastic couple that gave us a huge trailer who said this is for you to do your your plant deliveries and your compost deliveries and we wouldn't have managed to do them without it and so i think it's it's been interesting the how people have responded to us and what they've been able to offer us as well to help us keep going. I think going. friendships have been forged out yeah. of this quite seriously and yeah. we won't forget that. Yeah, yeah.